Hello, welcome back. Uh, now I'd like to extend some of these ideas around linearization that we introduced when studying um, phase portraits around equilibrium points to uh, the general um, state space models that uh, we've been we brought up in lecture one. So the purpose of the day is to work out how to linearize uh, general state space models about equilibrium points. Um, so what we would like to do, we would like to linearize uh, a model on the form x dot is equal to f of x u, y is equal to g of x u, about an equilibrium point, um, which is x u equal to x star u star. And so what must these, so these are just vectors of numbers, x and u, what must these vectors of numbers satisfy in order for this to be called an equilibrium point? Well, we just need that x dot is equal to zero. So about um, this point here, and in brackets, uh, we have x star u star is equal to zero. So this is our condition for x and u, oh sorry, x star and u star to be an equilibrium point. And we're just going to do exactly what we did um, with the uh, phase portraits. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce a set of variables that measure our deviation from the equilibrium point. So these are going to be a variable delta x, which is equal to x minus x star, so delta x gives you the distance between x and the equilibrium value of x. And we have the same for delta u now. Um, and we've got one variable left, which is y, so we need a delta y, and this measures the deviation in y from its equilibrium value, so from the values you get when you put x is equal to x star and u is equal to u star into g, so this is equal to y minus g of x star u star. So that's step one. Um, so we have these variables measuring our distance from equilibrium. And then step number two is we write it in uh, the following, we write, rewrite our system of equations in the following uh, linearized form. So we have d by dt, and here we, we now replace x with delta x. So x dot becomes delta x dot, and this is going to be equal to some linear term that depends on delta x. So we have some matrix of numbers a and the vector delta x, plus now a linear term that depends on u, delta u, and then all of the, everything that's left over. So here we have h um, of delta x, delta x and delta u. And just like when we were studying the phase uh, portraits, we need this um, extra term to be dominated by the delta x and the delta u terms. So there's going to be some condition um, governing how quickly this decays as delta x and delta u go to zero. And just like before, this is just to ensure that this behaves like squared powers and higher. So everything here is of the order delta x squared and delta u squared. Um, so we'll write down the technical condition at the bottom. It's not really super important for us at the moment. And, and we do the same with our secondary equation. We write it in terms of our deviation variables. And the linear term c delta x, another linear term d delta u, plus another term which collects all of the higher order stuff. And we'll give it another letter. So we've got some function of delta x and delta u, and our condition on h and k is that h of delta x delta u, when normalized by the length of the vector delta x delta u, so when we divide this by the length, and this is delta x1 squared plus delta x2 squared and we put in um, an x1 and x2, and we do that for all of our state variables, and then we do the same for our inputs, and so on, with squares on them. So this is the length of the vector 
delta x delta u. So this thing here, this is the length of the vector delta x delta u. And so we know it need that this thing tends to zero as delta x delta u tends to zero. And this is in direct analogy with what we saw when we were doing phase planes. This just ensures that the size of this term when compared to the vector delta x delta u, uh, so to the vector delta x delta u, um, is small. So when delta x delta u gets small, the linear terms dominate whatever is here. Um, so this is our target, this is our linearized form, and to do this we just repeat the method that we used for the phase plane case again. So that gives us two options. We either just um, find, we just substitute in directly and mess around with the equations until we get it in the required form, or we use uh, the Jacobian um, evaluated at the equilibrium point. And so we'll, let's just quickly see this um, in terms of the example. So if I just do an example. And let's, uh, in our example, let's linearize the following. So we're going to have a 2D system. So x1 dot, x2 dot, and then here let's have sine x2 and x1 plus zero, say. So here we've got a system in the form x dot is equal to f of x u. We want to linearize this about um, x star, u star, and let's say our equilibrium value for x is the vector 0, i, and our equilibrium value for u is just 0. And it's easy enough to just check that this satisfies our linearization uh, condition here. You see sine of x2, if x2 is equal to pi, this is 0, x1 is 0, u is 0, this whole thing is 0, so x dot is equal to 0. Um, so we have a nonlinear system, we have an equilibrium point we'd like to linearize around, uh, so let's just do it. Um, so let's start with our, I don't really know if we should call it a method, I'll just substitute in and mess around method. Um, so the first thing that we do is we introduce our delta variables, so delta x is equal to x minus x star, which is equal to zero and pi. And so this in particular implies that delta x1 is equal to x1, delta x2 is equal to x2 minus pi. And um, we have a similar thing for our delta u variable. In fact, because u star is equal to zero, we just get that delta u is equal to u. Fine, we've got our delta variables. Now we just dump them in our equation and we simplify. And so what do we get? Well, first of all, we substitute in for our x dot variables. So delta x1 dot is equal to x1 dot. And similarly, differentiating this equation shows that delta x2 dot is equal to x2 dot. So here we have d by dt. We substitute in for x1 dot and x2 dot. And we get this. And this is just equal to well, sine of x2, but x2 is delta x2 plus pi, so that's sine of delta x2 plus pi. And then here we've just got delta x1, and here we've got delta u. So we substitute it in, and finally we just need to isolate our linear terms. Um, and oh, we've got something that looks a little bit troublesome here, but that's no real issue. We just need to substitute in for the uh, Taylor series of this thing. And so, in particular, sine delta x2 plus pi. Well, if we just have a shift of pi in our sine, that corresponds to doing a minus sine. So if we shift our sine wave by pi radians, that's the same as just uh, mirroring it in the x-axis. So this thing is equal to minus sine delta x2. 
and now we just put in our series expansion here. And so sine of x is just that's delta x2 minus 1 sixth delta x2 cubed. Then we've got uh, 1 over 5 factorial, whatever that is, 625. A big number. And this is more than 100 here, so these things are getting very small. And so on. So the sine delta x2 is just this thing. This has got a linear term and it's got some higher order junk. So now we're ready to just isolate the linear term and isolate the junk. Um, so if we do that, what do we get? Well, this bit is just the same. And now we have the linear term that depends on delta x1 and delta x2. That's our A matrix. Then we have our B matrix, delta U, and then we've got everything else. So here, yeah, what bit depends on delta x1 and delta x2? Well, nothing here depends on delta x1, so we've got zero there. And now delta x2, oh, we have a minus delta x2. So we've got a minus one there. And similarly, what depends on delta u? Well, we have a one. Now let's deal with the second equation. Well, this is delta x2 dot is just equal to delta x1, so we've got a one and a zero, and nothing depends on u. And now we just have all of the junk. So we've got a 1 sixth delta x2 cubed, and so on. You see here. So just by substituting in and messing around, we've been able to put it into our um, linearized form with our linearized bit and a whole load of higher order terms. So that's fine. Um, but maybe you want something a bit more mechanical, and that's why we use this uh, second Jac Jacobian type method. So Two is you just say my A matrix is equal to a big matrix worth of partial derivatives evaluated at our equilibrium point x is equal to x star u star. And I'll just do it for the A matrix and I'll give you the formula for the B matrix and then the formulas for C and D you can just find in the lecture notes. Um, so here, what goes in here? Well, we've got df1, dx1, df2, sorry, df1, dx2, and so on. So we keep all the f1s in the top row, and we iterate the index of the x's in the columns. And now the second row, we have df2, dx1. Continues and we fill it out with as many state variables as we have. So, what do we have in this case? Um, right, so what is F1? Well, F1 is just the top equation in our model here. So, x1 dot is equal to F1 of x and u. So, it's equal to sine of x2 plus u. So, what is df1 by dx1? Well, nothing here depends on x1. So that's zero. df1 dx2, so we have to differentiate this bit with respect to x2, we get cos x2. Similarly, this term, df2 by dx1, well, this is f2 here. So f2 is equal to just x1. So df2 dx1 is 1, and nothing depends on x2, so we have a zero here. And then we have to evaluate it at the equilibrium point. Now the equilibrium point, at equilibrium, x2 is equal to x2 star, and x2 star is equal to pi. Cos of pi is equal to minus 1. This A matrix is the same as this A matrix. All is well with the world. And we've run out of room on the board here, but um, there are similar formulae in terms of partial derivatives, and they obey the same pattern that you see in um, the A matrix here to find the matrices. B, C, and D. Um, and the best way to get the hang of this is to just go do some examples. Um.